Now, this is what happens when you accidentally put a extra zero in your uh, fasting machine program and then walk off and go do something else. And you come over and you find your stone spinning around, fall, fell off of the motor completely and, and broke in half. So that's a good lesson learned here. I'll show you what I did wrong. I had uh, meant to write 20 steps forward, but instead I did 200, and so it ran right into the nut at the end of the axle and broke it right off. So always double check your programs. So one of the main issues I face is that uh, these step motors, they don't have any kind of memory about what angle they're at. And when you turn off the machine, they lose power. And if they're not energized, then you can move them freely. Uh, so when you, whenever you're cycling between programs, you're gonna lose your position. And uh, I don't have an easy way to be able to eyeball this plate when the uh, hip guard is in place. So that makes resetting the angle really difficult. So in the future, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this motor out and I'm going to try putting this, this digital protractor here instead and fix it to the axis so that then I can read the angle and set a hard stop so that it will cut at that angle and then it will just raise and lower the mast to the fixed angle and I'm hoping that that will eliminate that problem because then I can go from one program to the next and change out my, my wheels and my cutting laps and, uh, and not have to worry about the angle changing because right now I've got this cut to, um, it's like a, a fantasy cut. It's 20 facets all the way around the crown on the 3000 grit and I'm ready to go here to my 14K lap. Um, but now, <laughs> I, this lap is a different thickness, so I can't just lower this down to the lap and it's not going to be the same angle as it before because this lap is thicker than the 3000 grit lap that I used. So that means it's now touching at a different angle. So uh, in the past, what I've done is I've programmed it to raise and lo or lower the y-axis a certain number of steps that relates to the difference in the thickness between the two laps. Uh, the problem is, of course, uh, I'm limited to the resolution of about 25 microns, and uh, that can that can work fine for cutting stages where you're going to cut through that difference if you're off by a little bit. But once you get to the polishing, uh, if you're not dead on, then you end up having to spend a lot more time polishing because you're usually polishing either the back edge or the front edge, and then you have to basically recut the whole lap or the whole facet with a polishing lap, which takes a long time, and it's not very good for the lap either. So I'm hoping that with this fixed angle idea, that will solve that problem. So that's one of the problems I'm trying to address right now. Uh, so one of the other issues that's been really trouble to resolve is something really simple, just the drip pan itself. Uh, so I'll show you some of the versions I've gone through. Some of them I thought were quite genius, and others not so much. Uh, the first version was this one here, and uh, I really like this one because it's made out of silicone rubber. So it's flexible, which means if the machine runs into it, it just bends. It, it also meant that while it was on the lap, I could bend down the edge and look across and see how well the stone was lined up with the lap, and that made a huge difference for aligning and so all this is, is just a silicone cake mold with a bulkhead fitting here. <clears throat> this would be like a pool fitting. Uh, they call them bulkhead fittings. And so I just got one that was big enough for the shaft of the motor to stick up through here. And then it has this drain valve here, which had a nut at the bottom, drains out the fluid at the bottom, which is important because if you're running this machine automatically, you don't want to have to be there changing out the drip water uh, every few minutes or so. Um, and this worked fantastic for the first version of the motor I had, which was back when I had the motor mounted directly to the arbor. And so that was the first system. I had this threaded adapter, which simply went right on the end of the motor shaft right here. And I had my 
not here, but the wheels, and that just poked up through here. And that worked really well, but uh, as far as the drip pan goes, the problem was is that uh, this only has set screws on one side, and so it was just a tiny bit cattywampus, and that meant that at the edge of the plate, I was getting too much up and down movement or, or, or run out. Uh, which some of the old timers on the forums told me this would be a problem. I thought, ah, I'm going to try it anyways. And of course they were right. So I had to switch to a pulley system where I moved the motor. Uh, it's over here and I'll show you under the hood here at uh, some point. And then I have a pulley going over to these threaded rods, which are mounted to uh, a pair of pillow block bearings. Which that allowed me to get a much better alignment and reduce the amount of run out I had at the edge of the plate down to an acceptable amount. Um, I would like to get that even better in the future because if I can reduce all the wobble on the plate, that would make a huge difference. But once I went to the pillow block system, because it's square, I can no longer use this because it would have sat too high up off of the uh, table and run into the machine. So. Because I like the silicone so much, I thought, well, I'll just go with another silicone cake pan and I'll cut a square hole on it and I'll just glue a, a square shaped piece of Tupperware there. Uh, one of the problems, though, is that silicone is very difficult to glue to. Uh, they do make silicone glues, so I might acquire some of that at some point, um, but you need a special catalyst in order to be able to glue silicone to anything. So for the time being, uh, I got that idea. And I went to the dollar store and I got this here bucket and it's just a regular plastic here and I got my drain hole in there with a rubber gasket. I've got, I can, I can lift it out here you can see there's water in it right now. So every so often I'll just pour that out at the end of the casting procedure here. So you can see here I've got a drain hole here, rubber gasket. And this is just glued in with a whole bunch of epoxy. Uh, it's, I think it's, the, it's normal E6000 stuff you can get at a craft store. And there's a hole here. The tube is clamped into the hole from the bottom. So I can simply stick this down in here, push it down into the drain hole. And I have different notches cut in it here to allow for the machine to get down and cut uh, a 90 degree girdle when needed. So this is my current rendition of the drip pan and it works pretty well. And uh, those of you who ever try to find an aftermarket drip pan, you know it's just about impossible. So unless you wanted to spend, I think it's two or $300 on um, a professionally made one, then that's, that's been my solution so far. Okay, so the next big issue I'm going to talk about, uh, which came about because I was trying to solve another problem, is the way I put this whole thing together. And I did this for several reasons. One, uh, I wanted a machine that looked nice because initially I was going to try to uh, market the machine and sell it. Uh, later I decided I didn't want to bother with that type of hassle because I make my, my living selling jewelry and I'd be fine with that. So this became more of a hobby, which is why the whole machine looks really nice. It's got all the nice bezels here and the stained wood side is because I was trying to build it so that it would be a, a working prototype, a, a showcase type machine you could put in a storefront window, might even attract people into your shop, but uh, uh, that's not going to be what it is. So I used off the shelf parts that I could easily acquire at any time. It would try to reduce my overall cost in the machine by being able to buy these. This is a 2020 extruded rail. And it's used a lot in 3D printers, so it's very easy for me to get these brackets and these posts here and the corner brackets. Um, they're all off-the-shelf parts. Uh, but the other problem was is a traditional fasting machine has a base plate with a mast and it moves backwards and forwards on that base plate. But I know from experience that these machines, uh, no matter how good of a drip pan you put around them, produce a lot of overspray. And over time, I didn't want that overspray getting on the horizontal uh, bearings and causing rust issues or other problems. So I decided to put the x-axis up high where it would stay out of the way of most of the overspray. And then suspend the whole thing 
so that it can get over the top of the lap because as you approach the lap, you need to be able to get your stone to also rotate downwards and hit at a 90 degree angle so you can polish the table and polishing the table is also one of the main motivating factors here is because that takes forever to do by hand. So if you can simply push a button, walk away, come back in 10 minutes and it's done, that's, well, that's kind of the whole point. So that's why this whole machine is laid out this way. One of the big problems here that this presents is you have a twisting torque that can happen here. So initially when I designed this, this whole floating platform here did not have this cross press here or this one here. And immediately what happened was the whole thing just kind of torqued to the side. So then I added these additional linear rails here. These are eight millimeter linear rails with guides and this plate here to help hold this whole thing in position. And as you can see, that's actually pretty tight. Um, then I decided I need to add more linear rail down here. This one is not so tight. There's a lot of slop in this one. So future uh, me is going to do several things. One is going to be to take this whole setup and re-3D print this whole apparatus so that this plane here and this plane here are in sync or in line with each other and then create an entire back plate, probably out of aluminum, so that this rail and this rail are all one solid piece. So the whole thing moves backwards and forwards uniformly. And then this y-axis would travel up and down that plate, but it would always be uh, uniform. It always be, uh, I'm not sure there's like a better way for it than that, but you get the idea. So that is uh, in the future works, but that just takes more time, money, and copy. Um, and right now I only have lots of copy to spare. Uh, so that's just going to stay the way it is for now until I get this proof of concept working. Okay, so as promised, I'm going to show you what's underneath this machine here. And one thing I'm pretty proud about this machine is it's, it's very robust here. So I can just pick this whole thing up here by the bars like this and sort of tilt it back here. Just sort of set it on its side. Okay, let's see if the camera can see that. Let's lower the camera a little bit here. There we go. Zoom in. Okay, so now we got a good view. I'm going to kind of go over each component here. First, let's start with the motor. Uh, this is a, a normal 12 volt DC motor, and I have it fixed here. Uh, we have the pulley running over here. I have a two to one reduction because this motor runs way faster than I need it to. So I'm increasing my torque by having the reduction. Uh, one of the things I'm actually rather proud of here is this system here, RPM monitor, which is not something you see on very many fasting machines. And it's really simple. You can get the RPM meters online and they come with that uh, screen the screen you can see is actually mounted here and then it has this rpm sensor so in order to get this to work you have to spin a magnet past the sensor here within a few millimeters so the magnet is located in this plate here so i 3d printed this little bracket which just clamps on to the end of that bolt holds this in that position and then I 3D printed this bracket here, which is clamped onto the shaft of the uh, motor, uh, sorry, not the motor, but the, the arbor, and spins around. So every time it passes, it, it picks up a reading using a hull sensor. On this side right here, I only have this other side on here for counterbalance so that it keeps everything nice and even. This has a few metal washers glued into it, which weigh the same as the magnet. That gives me a nice, reliable RPM reading here. 
So the pump here, this is actually a medical type pump that uses uh, a wheel to squish the, the silicone tubing. And that way I can suck up water uh, from a bucket or from a jug. I'm using just a jug, an old water jug. And then it runs it up into the, uh, the drip pan. And the reason why I wanted to do this rather than a traditional gravity feed one is I wanted to be able to have a large water supply so that if I were running a long program, I didn't have to worry about running out of water in the middle of the program. And so this does that. And it also gives me the ability to automate the water supply. So it's hooked up to uh, one of these. Um, this is a, a, a 12 volt power supply with a potentiometer and an on off switch. It also includes a reverse function, but uh, I don't use the reverse obviously because there's no point that would just blow air bubbles down into my water supply. But later down the line, what I could do is I could put a relay in here that is controlled by my microcontroller so that I could turn the whole thing off um, by cutting power to it at the end of a cycle so it didn't continue to drip. And I could do something similar with the, the power supply that regulates the uh, motor as well. So I could turn off that at the end of the cycle as well. So the, the power supply here is, is right here. And this takes 110 and drops it down to 12 volts. And it's giving me three different places to tap into it. So I have one that runs to the motor uh, controller here. And I have one that runs to the pump controller here. And I have one that runs over to the Arduino here. So this is the Arduino. This is a Arduino Mega. And I needed the Mega because I needed all the extra pins. Uh, on top of the Mega, I have two motor shields. These are Adafruit motor shields, and each one has two ports to run to the motors, so that's four motors total. And then on top of that, I have a prototyping shield, which gives me these uh, screw connectors here because I wanted a way to connect all the wires that was going to be more secure than just plugging the ends into the ports there. So all that wiring harness then goes out and through the side there up to the motors and limit switches. And over here to the LCD screen right here, this is a 20 by four uh, LCD screen. And then I have uh, you know, the RPM monitor. This is the, uh, our, the um, potentiometer and switch for the pump and there's the pump so the inside of it is is pretty simple overall there's not a lot of extra stuff i mean i will admit that the the rpm sensor and the drip monitor is extra but i feel like it was really uh, important to have those on here because i needed to be able to control the speed and i wanted to be able to match up the speed to what the different discs recommended so for example uh, some of them say 300 RPM, some say 900 RPMs, and rather than having to just guess, I could just look at the RPM and know exactly what was going on. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about some of the problems I'm running into and some of the advantages and disadvantages of the machine. Most of the disadvantages, the obvious advantages are I have uh, a screen here that tells me uh, what the program is going on. I've got a really cool RPM meter. I've got a fancy schmancy uh, drip thing here and of course the main thing is is I can polish a gemstone without having to sit there Yes, I will be able to once I get the whole thing working a little bit better at this point in time though uh, It's a work in progress. So I'm going to keep on going along and Hopefully this will progress uh, And thanks for watching